All right. Uh, looks like we are live on Facebook. Uh, this is uh, Mark Malloy, the Emerging Revolutionary War, being joined by Billy Griffith and Bert Dunkerley. Um, and uh, the name of this evening's Rev War Revelry is uh, Unhappy Catastrophes, uh, New Jersey and the American Revolution. And uh, I was just talking to these folks before, uh, Bert has a, uh, that's the title of a book uh, in the Emerging Revolutionary War series. It's going to be uh, hopefully coming out later this year. Um, and we just noticed that this is actually the, the third book in the Emerging Revolutionary War series that focuses on uh, the state of New Jersey. Um, the first one was My Victory or Death. Uh, Billy then had a handsome flogging about the Battle of Monmouth. And now we got this unhappy catastrophe. So I think that clear to say New Jersey played a pretty significant role in the Revolutionary War, being that we focus so much on it. Um, and, uh, and I'll start with, you know, when we're talking about New Jersey and the Revolution and the folks who are watching at home, if you're watching from New Jersey or, um, or, or you've never been there, or you want to visit there, I uh, definitely want to tell you about a, an awesome opportunity you might have uh, this coming November. Uh, we are in November 12th to 14th, the Emerging Revolutionary War is doing our first bus tour uh, where we will be uh, traveling up to New Jersey and we will be visiting the sites of the uh, 10 Crucial Days campaign, uh, which was the battles of Trent and Princeton that occurred in December and January 1776-1777. Um, and like I said, this will be your opportunity to actually go to the sites uh, where some of this history happened walk the battlefields, learn about what actually happened in the actual place that happened, uh, which ultimately is really what Emerging Revolutionary War is all about. You know, we're really about the power of place, these locations, where the history happened. In all our books, we have guides that, that, that show self-guided tours to show you how to, how to navigate these battlefields and learn about them. And I feel like, uh, you know, we, we, you know, many people may have heard of Trenton and Princeton uh, and probably Monmouth as well. Uh, and those are kind of the, the big banner battles. Uh, and uh, there's no doubt that they were, they were inc incredibly significant. But New Jersey was much more than just a, a battleground for these, these, these major engagements. Uh, it was also the site of encampments, of minor engagements, of constant fighting, of uh, civilians trying to, you know, get out of the way of multiple armies marching through the state. It was a uh, it was really, you know, I think a good term for it is, you know, they call it the crossroads of the revolution, uh, because it really is uh, being traversed constantly. Um, so I'll turn it over to a uh, uh, Bert to, to talk a little bit about, you know, why uh, you decided to write this book on happy catastrophes and yeah, what does it cover? Um, and, uh, and why is New Jersey uh, this crossroads in the middle of the war? Well, thanks, Mark. And uh, before we jump into this, uh, a lot of you who are in New Jersey right now are probably dealing with storms and flooding. So just hope all of our friends in the Garden State are doing okay tonight. Uh, wanted to mention that. But um, I worked at Morristown National Park a couple of years ago and really enjoyed my time there and really got to appreciate uh, the importance of the revolution in that area. And one of the things that really stood out to me was uh, how much time the Continental Army spent, or both forces spent in New Jersey, um, several years worth of time. Of course, lots of battles and skirmishes and campsites. But one thing that I think is really important that, that I wanted to emphasize is, uh, you know, the Continental Army goes through several phases during the war. When the war starts, you've got a lot of militia around Boston and then uh, regular troops, the Continental Army is organized and fights around New York City. And a lot of those troops are one year recruits and their time is up uh, by the end of 1776. Uh, so by the time we get to Trenton and Princeton, uh, those battles are fought and a lot of the troops are able to go home. Uh, some stay on, but the point is that uh, by then, Congress had realized the need, which Washington pointed out, that we need long-term troops. Uh, we can't rely on just militia, and we can't rely on troops that enlist for one year, because this conflict is going to be longer than that. And we need to train troops professionally, and that takes time. 
So in the spring of 1777, after Trenton and Princeton, a whole new army uh, is organized, lots of new units, new recruits, and everything that they learn about fighting and marching and maneuvering, they're going to learn it in central New Jersey that spring. Uh, at a lot of smaller engagements like Short Hills and Bound Brook, uh, they're going to learn about foraging and skirmishing. And so the army that we often think of that fights in the big battles like Germantown and Brandywine and the winters at Valley Forge and that goes on to fight at Monmouth, that army had its origin in the spring of 1777 in New Jersey. So that, that's a long answer to, to, to part of your question, Mark. But I, I think it's, it's important to realize that uh, this army was in the process of being created and its proving ground was here. Yeah, no, uh, I think that time period, right, you know, in in my book, it's at the very end, and sometimes it gets overlooked, and I, I've heard it called the Forage War, as uh, this, like, kind of minor engagement, uh, but it had significant impacts on the entire campaign. I feel like without the actions and events uh, after Trenton and Princeton, those could have been passed off as a fluke and the British could have continued to, to move forward. But it's those actions afterwards that are going to have, you know, important effects later on. Yeah, I think, um, too, what we should mention a little bit with the geography of this part of New Jersey, too, and why the Continental Army uh, for many years is encamped and positioned there. And there's a big mountain range that runs through that area known as the Watchung Mountains. And with the British Army being their main garrison in New York City, uh, the Watchung Mountains was a great place to essentially put your line behind and use as a screen um, between the American and the British forces and give you a position to be able to monitor uh, New York City and what the British were planning there. And also to be able uh, to launch attacks against those various British patrols and foraging parties that are coming into a state. Uh, so the geography here and we have we said central Jersey, but it's usually like debated even between New Jerseyans themselves what it actually is. Central Jersey. I'm from uh, Somerset County, New Jersey, which is right there in Central Jersey, but it also includes Hunterian County, Middlesex County, Mercer, Monmouth, and then I think Union County as well, which we'll see the battles of Connecticut Farms and Springfield fought in later in 1780. I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about that. But yeah, that foraging war, um, it's, it really, Bert can talk a little bit more about it, but it's really going to force the British back towards New York City and uh, force them to rely on supplies being shipped in rather than collected because of this harassment effort that George Washington is launching against their forces in New Jersey. Yeah, I think it's it's one of those lesser known aspects of the war that, uh, you know, it's not a big battle, but it, it chips away at the British and German troops that are garrisoned in that area. It chips away at their morale, at their troop strength and, and at their supplies, and they have to pull back and lose some of what they've gained. And of course it hurts their morale and it conversely improves the morale of the, the civilian uh, revolutionaries. So it's extremely important. And the geography absolutely plays a critical role. Washington uses it brilliantly, those mountain ranges. And during that time, is he trying to defend like gaps in those mountain ranges to make sure the British can't get, in to, get to him uh, out there? Yes. And, yeah. and, and what kind of role did the New Jersey, you mentioned the, the morale, the New Jersey militia, uh, you know, did, what, what, what were they engaged in during this time period too? Did they rise up uh, after Trenton and Princeton? Were they active before then? Uh, were they kind of, you know, how, how, how did they, what was the role that they ultimately played in this time period? I would say that they probably do the best service of any state militia um, in, in any of the other 13 or 12, other 12 uh, states uh, because they're in the field so often, uh, you know, in the field, then released, then called back. But they, they, they serve in several campaigns. And by the time we get to the later period of the war, like 1780 and 81, uh, they're very dependable. They're very organized. They're very effective. And I think a lot of credit should go to the governor of Livingston. Uh, he's trying to govern a state that's bitterly divided, that has a lot of its 
territory occupied by the enemy, a lot of its important ports and areas occupied by the enemy. And he's trying to run a war effort under a lot of difficult conditions, but uh, they managed to do it. So there's, there's that whole aspect of this too that needs to be, uh, to be acknowledged. And for uh, the New Jersey militia, I know Mark was saying what was their role before or after Trenton and Princeton, uh, after New York City falls and Washington is falling back across New Jersey to get to the Delaware River. Uh, he's expecting a lot of the New Jersey militiamen to rise up to defend their homelands right now, but they aren't coming out in large droves like he had thought. And in fact, uh, William Howe is going to begin issuing amnesty to a lot of the civilians in New Jersey, allowing them to take oaths of allegiance uh, to the cr crown. And it's until after Trenton and Princeton that all of a sudden we see everybody coming back out of the woodwork to push the, the British back towards New York City. Yeah, I think that goes into, I mean, the divided loyalties in the state overall, I think, you know, you kind of see throughout the entire conflict of this seesawing as both armies are going through as far as, uh, you know, kind of trying to, to see which side is going to win this or whoever has the upper hand and trying to survive really uh, uh, during that during that time period. Um, do you also talk, you know, about like what it was like, yeah, for civilians, because uh, I mean, they must have been, you know, throughout the, the, the course of the war, whether it was Hessians looting and working their way through villages and stuff like that during that time period, or the American troops coming through as well and setting up m massive encampments uh, and other things like that and in their farms and homes and stuff like that. It must have been a pretty trying time for the civilians of New Jersey as well. Absolutely. And um, there are, you know, divided loyalties, as we all know. Uh, New Jersey has one of the largest uh, loyalist military units, uh, the New Jersey Volunteers. Uh, I think I won't go out on a limb too much when I say they probably sent as many troops to the loyalists as they did to the Continental effort. Uh, several thousand troops fight in various units for the British uh, either as guerrillas or as you know, provincial or loyalist troops that are trained, equipped, and outfitted by the British. And um, obviously, the civilians are caught in the middle. And even even if it's their friendly army that's that's in the area, yeah, the army is going to consume supplies and you know destroy the road network and use use up the resources of the area. So. Uh, certain areas are, are going to be heavily impacted multiple times. Yeah, and I know there, there's some, uh, you know, and I think it's true with any conflict where it, where it, you know, is neighbor against neighbor and, uh, you know, local against local. I mean, it's, it's going to be a lot of the fighting is pretty brutal and pretty um, intimate in the sense that a lot of times these were scores people were settling back and forth and then as the atrocities and other things build up you know it gets worse and worse and it seems like yeah towards the end there was a lot of um a lot of that happening in new jersey as well i mean there it happened in other states as well but um and i, I don't think new jersey was any different in that sense at all one one follow-up to that too is um you know washington of course understands that uh, the army needs civilian support. It needs, you know, widespread popular support to continue the war effort. Uh, but the army also needs to have its supply and logistical needs met. And that's a delicate balance. And uh, there's one point where he, uh, the, you know, it's late in the war. Uh, the economy has collapsed. The supply system has collapsed. The army needs food. It needs supplies. And, and, he really has no choice but to um, take from the civilian population. But he writes to his commanders that we're going to do this in an organized way with a reverence for the rights of the civilians. And he, what he does is he works with local county officials. So he, he tries to do it through this existing civilian court system, this, the legal system that exists in East County. Uh, to at least make it as organized and painless as possible. Uh, but it, they finally get to the point where they're like, you know, we have to take, uh, but we're going to do it in, a, in an organized and a, as a fair way as we possibly can. 
and Washington always appreciated the fact that, uh, you know, they're fighting for the civilians, but yet they need to take supplies from them. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that must have been yeah difficult for for the civilians to to deal with, and yet yeah, you have a uh, you have the military need if you're yeah quartering that many people uh, in New Jersey. And, and so, and also speaking of these encampments, you know, I feel like you mentioned Morristown already, you know, I think that, you know, and there's another uh, emerging revolutionary war book that just came out uh, a month ago by Phil Greenwald about Valley Forge, uh, which I feel like in American memory is, is, is well remembered as the, you know, the site of plight and suffering of American continentals. Uh, now there were, you know, at least two you know, there were two encampments, uh, if you want to call them that, at um, Morristown, and then one at Middlebrook as well. Can you talk a little bit about those encampments uh, and what those were like? Sure. Uh, there were two at Middlebrook as well, one in the summer uh, and one in, in a winter. And then later on, um, you know, then the armies leave and they fight in Pennsylvania and then they come back and um, there are smaller encampments around the state. Uh, you get into all kinds of interesting things like at, at Morristown, at the second, a, a later Morristown encampment, um, the Pennsylvania troops mutiny over lack of pay and, and issues over their enlistment terms. And then uh, not much longer after that, the New Jersey troops mutiny over pay issues. And, and Washington has to deal with those. He, he understands the issues that the soldiers face, but yet he can't let his army just walk away. And then, you know, you have the, the German and British troops uh, who often used, you know, existing structures and houses and public buildings, but, but they camp, uh, you know, New Brunswick and, uh, and other places across the state too. And uh, the Americans establish an artillery school. Uh, Knox is able to set up an artillery school and, and, you know, the army is starting to professionalize and in that sense become a legitimate fighting force if it's establishing a school for training. So there's all kinds of fascinating things to look at with the encampments. Yeah, now I, I always think it's interesting that, yeah, Morristown is so, uh, you know, uh, the winter was so terrible in that 1779-1780 um, winter uh, with all the snowstorms and everything, but it's just amazing. Yeah, it's been less well remembered uh, over time, uh, but it definitely deserves to be remembered. And as far as the Middlebrook encampment, is there, uh, uh, what, what's at that site today? Uh, is there a historic site or something that marks it? Uh, there, there's a small historic site and uh, un unfortunately not a lot, um, but that's also one of the things I wanted to emphasize is that uh, throughout this area, there are historic sites, maybe it's just a marker or roadside, you know, tablet, but uh, there are museums and historic sites. Uh, there are things to see, and there are a lot of great historic sites that need support. Uh, you know, the Bound Brook Battlefield, the Drake House, uh, the Springfield's Cannonball House. There's, there's historic sites throughout this area that need support. I wanted to raise the awareness of those sites and, and hopefully spur people into action. Um, a lot of us know about the great work that's being done by the Battlefield Trust uh, to preserve battlefield land and other groups like the DAR. So, you know, as the 250th anniversary approaches, let's use that as an opportunity to preserve more history and mark more sites. Yeah, no, it's a shame when, yeah, some of these places, yeah, get, uh are forgotten uh, and yet, yeah, let's, it's, it's great to, to remember where those things happened. And, and yeah, in this book, are you gonna include uh, a guide to, to show people where a lot of these, they can find some of these sites today? Yeah, uh, I list the historic sites and, and monuments and um, I've had a couple special battle maps created to show some of the details of lesser known sites like Connecticut Farms and Springfield and, and Bound Brook. Uh, you know, lots of important battles. These, these, again, these are small battles that the army fights. That they get experience before the big battles like Brandywine. Um, they have to get that experience first and it happens here. 
real quick. I want to uh, jump back to, to Middlebrook uh, in the sites today. I think that's definitely one of like the coolest little known sites uh, in that part of central Jersey. Cause the little tiny park itself, supposedly, you know, that's where uh, the continental army first flew the Betsy Ross flag um, in 1777. And then nearby as well, there's also a, uh, next to somebody's property, a preserved redoubt that the Americans built. And then all around the surrounding area, the same uh, houses still stand that were used as headquarters for like George Washington at the Wallace House in Somerville, New Jersey. Uh, Von Steuben's headquarters still stands. The thing of Green's headquarters still stands. And um, right near what's uh, a double A ballpark for the Somerset Patriots in Bridgewater, New Jersey is called the Van Horn House, which was used as Lord Sterling's headquarters during the latter. Uh, Middlebrook encampment, but it was also used during the Battle of Bound Brook and before that by Benjamin Lincoln. And there's actually right near there where the ballpark is, British that almost captured uh, Lincoln himself and drive him from the area during the uh, the Battle of Bound Brook. It's a cool spot. Yeah, yeah. There, there's there's a lot of things clustered in that area. Yeah. No, oh, yeah, I feel like uh, I have some family that lives uh, up in Bergen County and uh, have traveled around there and uh yeah there's there's small roadside plaques and markers all over the place so, yeah mentioning that washington either slept here or move, his troops moved through the area um and i feel like yeah sometimes people you, you lose uh, the significance of these things uh of why that's important why is it important to remember where these guys traveled through and because so much of it you know has been commemorated there in jersey because it was such a crossroads of the revolution. Um, but I think it's really important to, to kind of bring that to the fore to make sure people remember uh, the significance these actions played in the founding of the whole country. Hey, Mark, that would make a great uh, future bus tour. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's keep that in mind. <laughs> and we are hoping to continue doing uh, bus tours uh, so that people can actually come with you know uh historians on the actual sites to, to learn about what actually happened there well that's uh so you will and the other the great thing about new jersey is i think that it's really interesting how uh you know the state really witnesses how close the american cause came to defeat in december 1776 yeah there's important battles and then you have the important forage war now you mentioned these other ones uh you know, Springfield um, and things like that. Some of these are w later on in the war. So what happens there? Is that when Washington's, you know, I guess, can you give me some background on that? Just because I don't know sure. much about these smaller battles. Sure. Um, the town of Connecticut Farms is today Union, the town of Union, and Springfield is still Springfield. Uh, 1780, uh, the British have by this point invaded South Carolina and they've launched the Southern campaign. Uh, in the big picture, their goal is to recapture the Southern states and um, just sort of hold things in, in New York and New Jersey. And so the bulk of the British army under General Henry Clinton goes down and they, they easily overrun Georgia and they attack South Carolina, which they will, of course, as you know, Mark, they'll, they'll capture Charleston. And, and while they're away, um, General Nepausen, a Hessian general, is left in charge of the garrison of British and German troops. And um, some of the exiled loyalists in New York City convince him to uh, make a raid into New Jersey to go after the Continental Army. And that leads to the Battle of uh, Connecticut Farms, small engagement. Clinton returns and decides to, to do it again on a larger scale. They're trying to force their way from uh, Staten Island, go just west into New Jersey, straight towards Morristown, where the American army is camped. And uh, it's spring, 1780. And uh, the New Jersey militia rises to the occasion. Uh, they pour out, they, they assist the Continental troops in slowing down the British and Germans. And, um, they're just not able to make any headway and they pull back. Not a huge engagement at Springfield, but it's the last large engagement fought in the state. And there are several historic markers scattered around. Again, most of the battlefield is built over, but you can still find things. 
And, Bill, uh, do you have any more to add on that? Yeah, well, look, uh, Nip House, and yeah, he's heading for, Mark was asking about gaps in the mountains. Well, he's heading towards one. It's called a Hobart Gap, and he's trying to get through the Wachung Mountains so then he could strike Morristown, like Bert was saying, but he was uh, repulsed in his effort. Uh, kind of one of the myths that really surround, or not really a myth, but a legend, you can say, that surrounds the Battle of Springfield and Connecticut Farms is there was a Continental Army chaplain named James Caldwell, um, who is lives at Connecticut Farms. And during that first engagement there, uh, his wife, Hannah, is actually killed by a British soldier. So then at Springfield, James uh, Caldwell is fighting uh, with the New Jersey men there, and he's actually distributing uh, paper from hymn books to be used as wadding for artillery and for musket balls. And he's supposedly yelling at his men to, or the men to give him watts because it was the author's name of this hymn book. Uh, and I think Caldwell is later on killed by like an American century in maybe 1782 or something like that later on. And that century is actually hanged because of it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. <laughs> another another great part of that story is the Americans used the, the ridges, the, the Wachton Mountain ridges uh, for, for observation and they had signal towers. Uh, they had you know large wood piles stacked up that if the British made a move, they could see them coming and they'd light these towers so everybody in the distance could see the, the you know the, the the fire start on the mountain and know that's the signal for the militia to come out and to know that the British were making a move. Um, it's, it, it's, it's a beautiful system and it worked very effectively. Yeah, it seems like a, it's a, like a large chess match uh, with both sides kind of sitting and watching and trying to gain some sort of advantage. Uh, and, you know, it seems like a lot of times, you know, I mean, with the Americans, it seems like they have the, they have the benefit of time on their side that they're basically trying to, to, to stay there and look for an opening. Whereas I think the British are really trying to draw them out at some point so they can actually destroy Washington's army, but uh, never really get that major opportunity. Um, and as the war progresses, you know, as long as that Continental Army is still there and still a threat, you know, the war continues to go on. So it's kind of interesting to, to view it in that prism. Yeah, you're right, Mark. Um, time is is on the American side because the longer they drag it out, the, the war, the more the war costs the British in terms of money and men, and it's becoming unpopular at home. And, you know, the Americans have their challenges, too, that their economy is going down the tubes and they're having trouble recruiting and so on. But uh, the Americans are here. Every British soldier who has to be replaced has to come from across the ocean, and so do their supply lines. And so uh, not getting trapped, not being forced into an engagement he doesn't want to fight is what Washington does. Uh, it just keep the war going, and it just wears the British down. The British have to garrison all the territory they've captured, which means if you think about it from Canada down to Florida, they've got to have garrisons. Uh, it's extremely expensive and it, it, it eats up a lot of manpower. Yeah, no, it's something that, you know, I noticed at Trenton and Princeton after the Forage War in that spring of 1777, you know, as the British are losing men from the weather, from disease, from skirmish casualties, from battle casualties. Uh, yeah, there's, you know, they have to come from, unless they're recruiting loyalists or whatever, uh, you know, they have to come from across the ocean. And so every loss is almost irreplaceable. Um, so it, it really, really uh, limits their ability to, to function at that point. Um, we've been getting some uh, comments. I've been looking at the comments on, uh, on our Facebook page. We got some people asking about things down in South Jersey, uh, Red Bank, um, and there's some other uh actions down there um your book is going to cover just central jersey or will it cover any of those actions down there uh, right i just stick to the central part of the state but <clears throat> yeah there are a lot of important sites elsewhere of course you know monmouth is, is outside of what i pay attention to but Mon you know, monmouth is important uh red bank part of the philadelphia campaign uh very costly battle and a very nice historic park there today 
uh, th there's a lot of things to see in the southern part of the state. Yeah, no, and I, I think, uh, you know, all across New Jersey, it seems like, yeah, there's there's actions happening all over. Um, and then, uh, uh, so we covered, and it, I think the we mentioned a little bit about the, the loyalists um, uh, being drawn up uh, or a large loyalist population in the, in the state as well. What happens uh, after the war? Um, do most of them leave? Are there reprisals on them for, for sticking or, or for staying loyal to the king? Or, or I know in Virginia and uh, South Carolina too, there's a lot of uh, uh, confiscation of their lands and many of them actually evacuate with the British at that time too. Uh, do you know what happens to many of these loyalists? Uh, a lot of the same, a lot of the same. Uh, Billy, do you have any more details on that? I mean, yeah, being uh, in such close proximity to New York City, they kind of have a safe haven that they can all escape to uh, and then depart with the British Army in uh, 1783. Or is 84, 83. Uh, yeah, 17. So officially, yeah, evacuate New York City. <laughs> Yeah, now uh, in the yeah the yeah the evacuation of New York, um, and then yeah, and then and then New Jersey is gonna yeah, and one of the things I think is also interesting from the loyalist perspective too is the the loyal governor too, uh, yeah. who is Ben Franklin's son, um, uh, which is uh, again another tragic uh, story of uh, in this case a family that's uh, divided over the war. It's really interesting. Absolutely. And I'll throw out, um, New Jersey has the only original royal governor's residence that you can visit today. It's a state historic site and it's the original structure. So you really? know, places like in Williamsburg and uh, other, other states, they've reconstructed them, but New Jersey has the original royal governor's mansion. Yeah, it's right in uh, Perth Amboy. Okay. Yeah, no. Yeah. And then there are some, you know, I feel like there's a, there are a lot of battlefields and things like that, which are yeah totally lost or whatever. Um, you know, I'm thinking of uh, Light Horse Harry Lee's uh, action that he took there. The name is escaping me. Uh, um, I think it's at Perth Amboy's. Um, you think of Paulus Hook? Paulus Hook. There you go. Yeah. Um, which, yeah, I don't think there's anything left of that battlefield whatsoever. Um, no, it's, uh, it's all, it's, it's all high rises and so on, but there is a marker for it. Actually, okay. it's a mon stone monument, uh, at the site of the fort. So at least there's that. Mm -hmm. And some of these other like short hills and, um, uh, you know, is there a battlefield park? Are there any other state or local battlefield parks, um, outside of the major ones, like, uh, Trent or Princeton and uh, Monmouth? Unfortunately, no. Uh, there are markers, monuments, and in some cases, historic sites like a historic house uh, that you can visit. So you can sort of piecemeal it together. Uh, if you go and visit these places, you've got to drive around and find where the actions were. And I try to, to help people do that in the book. But yeah, there's there's so many sites that are, are not preserved. But again, I think we have that opportunity, uh, especially with the 250th anniversary coming, let's, let's make a real difference because um, it's a lasting legacy. If we preserve this land, it's preserved forever. Yeah, I mean, just it's, it's, it's tough to preserve everything that happened in Jersey when it comes to the Revolutionary War, because I was just looking through today again, back near the Bicentennial, there was a book that was put together that document or includes every documented mention of an engagement um, that occurred in, in New Jersey. And it's like well over 100 pages. And there's like, you know, 10 or more entries on every page. So you think that's, you know, over a thousand battles and skirmishes that occur. Uh, within New Jersey's boundaries. So many of these fights, it is just the militia going out and it, bam, real quick, hitting a British patrol and running, or it's a fighting match taking over or, or running mat battle, taking over, you know, wide spaces uh, throughout, usually in the same exact spots over and over again. Um, just, I know like near Edison, New Jersey, uh, was known as Bonham Town uh, during the Forge War. I was looking today, there was at least 
a fight there like at once or twice every single month for you know like a four or five month period yeah, yeah. quibble town um what else there's so many so yeah. many of those little raids and skirmishes yeah, and even just like during the Monmouth campaign as Clinton's army is trying to retreat um, through part of uh, South Jersey to Monmouth County, you know, he's getting hit by the New Jersey militia and New Jersey um, provincial, or not provincials, New, just New Jersey state units um, literally every day along that way, all along his route. So it's just, it's a constant battle. Yeah, no, and, and although, the, you know, yeah, although... And oftentimes things are are have been developed up or built over the fact that, that in my research for Trenton and Princeton, although a lot of the actual battlefield of Trenton has been developed, uh, you know, there's a they they've done a great job of marking uh, many of the significant locations, which I think is really important. Um, you know, if you're at Trenton, uh, you know, like I said, it's in the middle of the city today, where most of the fighting took place in December 1776. Um, and if you go down it, among, uh, the, you know, the city streets, you'll find plaques up on the wall saying where Rawls headquarters were, uh, where different significant homes were, where, uh, uh, other significant sites are. Um, so I found that really helpful. The second battle of Trenton or the battle of Aston Pink Creek was, a really, a just like a, a bunch of small skirmishes that lasted all throughout the day of January 2nd, 1777. And today there are markers at each of the creeks where they fought, uh, letting people know what happened there back in 1777. So even though there's oftentimes there's not much left of the battlefields, uh, I'm, I'm glad to see local organizations, local groups are taking the initiative uh, and putting up, uh, whether it's a, a monument plaque or a, just a state highway marker, uh, different things to mark those locations. And even, and that's, and it's happening to this very day. Um, our, our friends at uh, the Brunswick his, uh, uh, Historical Society, I think, uh, are putting up a monument for Ironworks Hill. Um, uh, they're redeveloping the monument that's there uh, and putting up interpretive signage. Uh, and we had a blog post about that a few weeks ago. And so that's hopefully gonna be happening later this year. So, uh, but it's just, it's great to see uh, the people in New Jersey, yet, yeah, like I said, uh, individuals and communities and groups taking that initiative to, to mark those locations. And yeah, hopefully with larger national groups like the American Battlefield Trust uh, and things like that, that we can, we can help preserve as much that's left uh, so that they can be further interpreted and memorialized uh, over the coming years. And, you know, Bert mentions the 250th anniversary. This is going to be a great opportunity to highlight, uh, yeah, the the battles, the sacrifices of all these people from that time period. Uh, so, so really good to see. Even though there's there's been a lot, you know, a lot that's been 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 lost in the process. It's great to see so much stuff still memorialized and marked. And Mark, I'll add that, you know, a lot of us. Uh, who are really into this, uh, you know, we've been to the big places, like we've been to Valley Forge and um, Monmouth and Yorktown. And I love going to those places. But, you know, if you've been to a lot of the big sites, sometimes it's fun to delve a little deeper into the things that you may have heard about, or the things you don't know much about. And, you know, you find history everywhere. And so it's fun to find those lesser known uh, things at a deeper level. And like I said, too, it, it illuminates whole new aspects of the war about civilians, about logistics, about tactics and training. You learn so much when you visit these lesser known sites. Yeah, I think, I, that, and that's a great question. So what do you think, uh, I'll ask both of you, what you think is the least known uh, or most overlooked uh, action or thing in New Jersey uh, that really deserves to be remembered and why. And I'll, I can go ahead, I'll go first and I'll yeah. tell you more. Uh, <laughs> and that is, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm a bias because I think that the, the, the 10 Crucial Days campaign was so significant. Uh, but I feel like Trenton and Princeton are very well understood and remembered and like I said, pretty well marked and laid out. Um, but it's that second battle, the Battle of Aston Pink Creek that I think is often overlooked. 
uh, and usually kind of thrown in in the middle of those 10 crucial days as an event, but doesn't really stand out as its own major significant event. Uh, but when you look at the history and you look at these engagements that happened all day on January 2nd, 1777, and then you see the action that happened at the creek there, which today there's a nice little park there and the bridge there's, you know, is still there. It's a modern highway now, but, you know, there may even be, I think, some actual original parts of it inside that, that modern bridge. Uh, but then when you read the, the accounts of the British attacking that bridge, and what would have happened if they were able to either get to that location earlier or break Washington's line, uh, you know, it would have changed the whole trajectory of American history. Uh, but, and Washington's then gonna disengage and go fight at Princeton the next day. But uh, that, that engagement, the fighting that happened throughout the day on January 2nd, 1777, and the battle that happened that evening at the Creek um is often overlooked as a minor small skirmish um but it was really a, a major significant event that's been overlooked um and yeah today i think there are some waysides down there but there hasn't it been a lot of memorialization of this uh this one event and i don't think a lot of people realize how significant it is so that's what i that would, that would be my my uh two cents but what about you guys what do you guys think um there's, <laughs> it's hard to pick one, but I'll throw out um, the spring 1777 Battle of uh, Short Hills, which involves the British uh, moving towards the Americans and the Americans falling back. Um, modern day Scotch Plains, the, uh, the Americans have two brigades of four regiments each. So it's eight regiments of Continental troops and the British are going to advance on them. So we have some skirmishing and then deploying and then fighting small battle, but it involves several thousand troops. And again, on the American side, these are new units that are getting combat experience and they're not going to fight a battle that big again until Brandywine. Uh, so I think, again, it's, it's that experience of maneuvering, the, you know, learning the, the process of, falling back, reforming, fighting in lines, and, and fighting in large units like brigades and a division. Uh, those are important skills that, you know, they can practice all they want in camp, but uh, it's when it counts that it really matters, and they just don't get many opportunities to get those skills. And today, there are some historic markers uh, that talk about that engagement, but there's no park but there's still open space that could be preserved. So hopefully we'll see that happen. Uh, well, I think there's two sites in New Jersey that deal with two probably the most notorious men uh, on the American side during the um, Revolutionary War. And one of them is in Basking Ridge. They're both sites are buildings. Buildings don't stand anymore, but they are marked. One is in Basking Ridge and that's the White Tavern site where Charles Lee in December of 1776 is taken prisoner by a, uh, a party of British dragoons, which actually included a young uh, cornet, Bannister Tarleton. Um, obviously, that was a huge blow uh, for the American cause right there, uh, since Lee was considered to be probably the best uh, battlefield commander in the army, even above Washington. Uh, he was definitely seen that way from through British eyes, as well as the most uh, despised man being a British, a, uh, a, who someone who immigrated from from. Uh, British right before or Britain right before the war. And then the other one is in Morristown. And it is the site of what was known as the Dickerson Tavern. And in December through January of 1779 to 1780, it's in this tavern that the court martial of Benedict Arnold was actually held. And although Arnold is acquitted on these charges, he is issued a reprimand from George Washington. And that's really the kind of the straw that breaks the camel's back for him and he begins to take the nosedive towards treason and doesn't turn back yeah no i think that's kind of a uh that's kind of interesting yeah political aspect of uh new jersey's history during the war as well it's kind of interesting um all right and then what about uh what about where you know obviously bert you got your book coming out um uh, later this year uh but What's a good book uh, that people can read to learn more about New Jersey and the revolution, uh, if you have a good recommendation? 
and I could go first too. I'll, and again, yeah, I'll, I've got I'll, something I can't remember the title, but go first. <laughs> I mean, again, uh, you know, through my research of uh, the 10 Crucial Days campaign, you know, Washington's Crossing by David Hackett Fisher, I think is really good in, in showing, um, uh, uh, you know, that retreat across New Jersey and the impacts that had on the civilians and a lot of the places they go through. Um, and uh, there's, there's another great book uh, by a guy named Dwyer. Um, it's called, uh, let me see, I think it's called, uh, yeah, The Day is Ours by William Dwyer, uh, which I think also really shows a lot of that uh, civilian perspective of what it was like living under um, uh, during that during that time period when armies are marching through the area. So, uh, and of course, it you know, Hackett Fishers and Dwyer's both cover the, the battles of Trenton and Princeton, which again are, are important, but yeah, not as lesser known as some of these other engagements. I still can't remember the first one that comes to my mind, but I'll just throw out, and a lot of our audience knows about uh, Joseph Plum Martin's Private Yankee Doodle, great uh, perspective from the common soldier, and uh, Ewald, Johann Ewald's um, Hessian officer's diary. He's involved in a lot of the marching and maneuvering and um, you know, gives, gives a, a ground level perspective from a, a German officer. And he has some great sketches and drew maps of some of these engagements and they're wonderful resources. And we've had a couple good uh, on the chat. We've had some good uh, Larry Kidders of People Harassed and Exhausted, which is really good. Uh, so yeah, I also recommend that. Uh, John Resto uh, included, yeah, the uh, revolutionarywarnewjersey.com as a good place that shows, and I, I've used that uh, yeah. to you know, find, you know, where some of these markers are and, and what's uh, what's marked and stuff like that. So those are great resources as well. Yeah. Bailey, you got anything? Yeah, that one book that I had mentioned that was published around the Bicentennial, I wanted to get the actual title of it. Uh, it was It's called Battles and Skirmishes in New Jersey of the American Revolution, and it's by David Munn, uh, and it is yeah. a publication of the New Jersey Geological um, uh, Survey. So yeah, that's or t topography. Um, but yeah, that's a fantastic book, because like I said, it literally does. Every documented occurrence we have of guys popping shots at each other uh it's included uh in this book and broken down too in alphabetical order um for what town it's from so it's very easy to use yeah it's really uh really indispensable stuff yeah uh, I'll, i got and then i'll say uh fatal sunday by yeah gary willer stone and mark edward lender about the monmouth campaign is absolutely fantastic too for both armies experiences going across uh new jersey as well as um, the political ramifications of it all and what was going on outside the ranks in New Jersey too. And uh, I just found my, the one I couldn't think of, it's called The Uncertain Revolution uh, by John Cunningham. It's about the revolution in the Morristown area. And he, he covers all aspects, uh, supply, logistics, the civilians, uh, really good history of things in that area. Fantastic. Yeah, no. And yeah, we, we lot, lot of good uh, um, uh, other books uh, in the chat as well. So make sure everybody checks those out. Too many to even mention. Um, but yeah, no, I think, and again, you know, one of the great things about tonight's discussion that I thought was really interesting is, yeah, the, the like, again, the, the importance of the places. Uh, and that's where, you know, like I said, if you haven't checked out our, uh, our blog, emergingrevolutionarywar.org, you can go there and learn more about our our bus tour of Trenton and Princeton in November, where we're gonna actually actually be able to go around with uh, myself and Billy and Rob Orson, and we're gonna go around and, and point out, take you to some of these places to actually be on the ground to actually see them. Uh, and we can talk about the the sites, at the, the actions at the locations where some of them happened. Uh, but I, I'm really looking forward to Bert, your book. Uh, you know, it'd be great to have a resource uh, that combines a brief overview of, of these actions and then also uh, what locations where they took place and how you can get there and what you can see there, uh, which I think really ties the story to the place, which ultimately is, is uh, yeah, what we're trying to do here. So, Well, uh, thanks. And again, I, I want to emphasize, I really push 
and and want to promote the the local historic sites um you know the big national parks and state parks are, are kind of well known and and kind of well funded but uh it's those little locally run historic sites and museums that really need support especially now especially after the year we've had and uh they do great work so i, I definitely want to encourage everybody to promote those sites and the, the programs that they do yeah absolutely like i said you know that work is is uh you know is happening uh yeah in these communities all over the place so yeah reach out to uh, if you're up in new jersey uh reach out to them but you know even myself from down here in virginia you know i'm happy to uh you know keep in touch with some of the folks i know up there and uh try and help support their organizations and help uh yeah support telling these stories uh, in any way we can so that people will remember them especially as we come up on the, the major anniversaries here in, uh, in just a couple of years. So, all right. Well, thank you, uh, Bert, for joining us this evening. Uh, thank you, Billy, as well. Uh, if anybody else uh, uh, has anything, you can throw it into uh, the, the, the chat box here. We'll try to get back to you. Um, but otherwise, stay in touch with us. We're going to be back here again for another uh, Rev War Revelry uh, in two weeks. Um, uh, so keep tuned to that. Uh, you'll find all our events on our Facebook page. Make sure you subscribe to our blog so you can get updates on not only these talks, but our regular blog content, and then also uh, different publications and tours we got coming up. But thank you guys for joining us, and we'll uh, talk to you later. Thanks, everybody.